Welcome back. For those of you who have been um, listening to my lectures uh, during quarantine here, this is our last. We are finished um, with this. So aside from this, after this uh, section, then you'll have the video quiz and then the quiz over section two. And then there is a video quiz over just life in the 1980s. Um, it's unfortunate that we couldn't watch Forrest Gump or uh, do a little bit more, but we just ran out of time. And that's okay. Hopefully I'll be able to see most of you next year. So anyway, let's go ahead and um, get over or get through this. Um, it's only 20 slides. There's a lot of information, but it shouldn't take us too long. Okay, today we're going to talk about um, Reagan's second term. So in 1984, he's pretty popular. He's, he's the, the economy has turned around. He's running against Walter Mondale. Now, Walter Mondale had been Jimmy Carter's vice president. And so he's coming and he's running against Reagan. And he does something that is um, kind of revolutionary. He chooses a woman to be his running mate. This woman right here, she was a congresswoman from uh, New York. Her name was Geraldine Ferraro, and she was just a, a great candidate to run with him. So she is the first woman to be on a major party ticket um, running as a candidate for president or vice president. It's really a sad story. In 2008, she supported Hillary Clinton in her bid for president against Barack Obama in the primary, and she made the comment, she's like, look, if Barack Obama wouldn't be, if he wasn't black, we wouldn't even be talking about him because he doesn't have the experience or the training necessary to be president. And for that, she was labeled a racist. But I can tell you, she did a lot uh, for minorities within her district during the time that she was in Congress, um, you know, as a, a Democratic Congresswoman. So it's really unfortunate that people gave her such a label, which I don't think that she deserved. Um, but anyway, so um, Mondale and Ferraro ran against uh, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush. And Reagan's popularity was pretty good because the economy had turned around. And also because we had this military mission in 1983 to Grenada, which is an island in the Lesser Antilles, just north of South America, um, to go and assist when um, there was a coup against the democratically elected uh, government there. So they go in there, um, they protect American lives because there were some Americans who apparently were going to medical school there. I guess they couldn't get into a medical school here in the United States. So uh, they went to one um, down there in the Caribbean. Um, but anyway, so that was in October of 1983. I joined the army and went off to basic training in November of 83. And when I got out of basic training, I met this guy who had been to Grenada and he kind of had a Forrest Gump thing where he had gotten shot in the buttocks. And they decided to leave the bullet there though because it would have done too much damage to um, his tissue had they removed it. So, but he liked to go around and tell everybody that story. Um, but anyway, Reagan also increased a lot of women into um, his cabinet, right? Uh, many of these women were conservatives like Phyllis Schlafly, who was not in his cabinet, but they, they had the same belief as her. Um, they were opposed to the Equal Rights Amendment, but nonetheless, they were women and they were in politics, right? So he had done that uh, as well because we see the rise of women in politics. Um, but the only state that Geraldine Ferraro and Walter Mondale won was his own, uh, which was Minnesota. They also won Washington, D.C. Other than that, this was a huge, huge, probably one of the biggest landslides ever in our nation's history, right? Again, Reagan was appealing to those um, those Reagan Democrats. Clinton's going to do the same thing. There's going to be Clinton Republicans, people who can kind of appeal to both sides of the aisle. Okay, so this is the operation I was talking about in Grenada. We see our, our guys coming down uh, on this Black Hawk here, uh, landing at the island. Um, so they go there. The guys that went there, they told me they didn't have military maps. We have military maps um, for almost every location across the, the planet. And what they show are geographic features, right, like elevation and everything else. Well, I guess the guys here, we didn't have military maps. So the only thing they used were like these touristy maps, kind of like the thing you get when you go to Disneyland. It shows like the you know, Magic Kingdom over here and that sort of thing. So they, they really didn't have uh, the ability to go and, and um, 
I don't know, they didn't have the resources uh, to be very efficient there, let's just call it that. So it's a very small island, and they put down this insurgency pretty quickly. Unfortunately, though, there was a loss of American lives. 19 Americans were killed as a result of this. It was called Operation Urgent Fury. Um, some people argue that we shouldn't have been there, but um, the, the thing that is is that other countries in the region appealed to the United States for it, and Reagan thought that it was the way to go to show our strength in the region um, and also to protect American lives. So some people debate whether that was necessary or not. Regardless, it did increase his popularity. Okay, and then this lovely lady is Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, she went to law school. Well, she was born in Texas. Um, she went to Stanford and uh, got a law degree, and she had been the assistant attorney general in Arizona. She was a conservative, and Reagan appointed her to the Supreme Court. She was the first woman to the Supreme Court, um, and she was a great role model uh, for women. She also rode her horses. She was a very independent-minded woman. Uh, Reagan also appointed William Rehnquist to, as the chief justice of the Supreme Court, Antonin Scalia. Um, who just passed away in the last year of Barack Obama's uh, administration, and then also Anthony Kennedy, who left the court shortly after Trump was elected, and Trump got to um, appoint a judge in his place, right? Um, Justice Kavanaugh. So if you look at the, the people who have were circled, the man in the middle there, that was William Rehnquist. He appointed him as the Chief Justice. The man on the far left is Antonin Scalia. The man on the far right um, is Anthony Kennedy. He was a, a real moderate um, justice. And then the woman seated in between William Rehnquist and Anthony Kennedy is Sandra Day O'Connor. So this picture would have been taken I'm thinking it's probably during Clinton's administration because Clinton appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the second woman on the Supreme Court who is still there. And then George H.W. Bush, um, he appointed Clarence Thomas, who is the African-American uh, in the background. And he was appointed after Thurgood Marshall left the court. Right, So that's what the court looked like when Reagan, well, actually when Clinton was in office. Sandra Day O'Connor then left, I think, during, um, I'm not sure exactly when she left. Might have been, oh, during George uh, W. Bush's administration. Okay, um, so during Reagan's second term, there was a lot of concerns over the economy. Like I told you, people were really concerned with the deficit, that the government was spending more than what they were taking in. And so um, there were always these deficit clocks showing us how much in debt we were. And so what people wanted to do was balance the budget. So they passed this act known as the Graham Rudman Hollings Act. And what this was supposed to do is cut government spending so that they could balance the budget, right? And so it was supposed to put into place these automatic spending freezes uh, when government had overspent, right? So a lot of people didn't really like that about it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there's also tax reform laws, which basically ends up um, making it to where it reforms it to where people can't skirt, kind of get around paying their taxes. There's also a lot of problems um, at the stock market because there's insider trading, and we do get a stock market crash in November or October of 1987. Okay, so here, this is another way of looking at the deficit, and the deficit is the image, it just shows it, you know, as it goes deeper and deeper into debt. Right. And so this right here from Carter to Reagan, this shows where it went into debt. Right. And then this right here is George W. Bush's administration. And then um, George uh, or H. W. Bush, he raised taxes and also they cut spending. And so during Clinton's administration, there's going to be a surplus. Um, the government is actually bringing in more than what it is spending that hardly ever happens, right? And then we're going to go um, after 9-11. This is a deep, deep um, deficit, excuse me, deficit spending right there. Okay, so people are worried about that. So as a result, we get this balanced budget bill, um, and it was supposed to put in place these emergency controls where it just halts 
the spending. So you get two Republicans and a Democrat who put this forward. The, the Democrat was Hollings. And what it aimed to do is uh, balance the budget, right, and cut the deficit, which, of course, it didn't happen. So they went through this. There was supposed to be um, sequesters, where automatically there was supposed to be a freeze in spending. And we still do that. And then Congress votes to go around the, the freeze there. Later, this whole process was ruled unconstitutional, so it was all for naught. Okay, but there was a problem with insider trading. If you've ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, I never have. I heard it's pretty uh, obscene. Uh, but anyway, there was this big stock market boom. People are buying and selling and that sort of thing. But there's a lot of de um, irregularities. And there was some deregulation of it, too. And so people were trading in stocks who shouldn't have been um, because they knew the insider information, who was gonna, what was going to be sold and what was going to happen. And so all of this was exposed. And so um, people really didn't trust the whole system uh, very much at that time. There was also this deal. There's a savings and loan crisis where people are putting money into these banks, the savings and loan, which were insured by the federal government. And so here they would get back in 19, what is this, 87? Is it 87 here? Um, they, no, that's 67, I think. I can't read this. Uh, they would get a big return on their dollar, right? But that kept diminishing and diminishing. And then pretty soon, uh, the banks were no longer solvent. And so the federal government had to come in and bail them out. But when you think about it, okay, that money was somewhere and somebody got it. So who got it? And why are the American taxpayers bailing the banks out if they're mismanaging their money? And so this was scandalous, and there were investigations and everything that was going on as well um, in Congress as a result of that, because it looked like it was fraud against the government um, to federally insure these banks who were not solvent. Okay, and then there was the Iran-Contra affair. You're going to watch a video on this. So in, um, in Nicaragua, uh, there was a group of people called, well, under um, the Somoza government. Somoza was a bad leader, and he was he probably needed to be overthrown. He was a dictator. He was overthrown by a group called the Sandinistas. The Sandinistas were backed by the Soviet Union and the Cubans, right? They were getting funding that way. This alarmed the United States because they were communists, and there was a group of people who opposed the Sandinistas who were called the Contras. So we were aiding the Contras, but then Congress didn't like that because the, con the Contras were being funded through the drug trade, right? And so we get the Boland Amendment, which basically says you can't fund these people anymore, but they found a way of going about around that, right? Where there were weapons that were being sold to Iran, uh, and which weirdly enough, Iran, in that country, um, there had been some Americans taken hostage by this one terrorist organization. So we said to the government of Iran, get these people released and we will sell you some weapons. They needed weapons. They were uh, fighting a war with Iraq. And so we would sell them the weapons and then the money from the sale of the weapons. Oh, and um, they would get our hostages free. And some of that money for the the weapons purchase was going to the Contras to fund them. So it was illegal in the sense that Congress didn't want them to do this, but they were doing it anyway. All right. With the Cold War, even though during Reagan's first term, there was increased tension between the United States and the Soviet Union, it was lessened his second term. And the reason for it is because there's a new leader in the Soviet Union by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev, right? So Gorbachev comes to power and what he finds is that they cannot really compete with the United States militarily um, because they just, they didn't have the resources or the ability to do so. And so he said, we need to implement some change. So there's two new policies. One of them is something called glass notes. Think of glass. It's transparent, so it's openness, right? There was going to be this policy of openness in government, so it wasn't going to be any more secret uh, government. Uh, and it's supposed to get rid of corruption as well. There's also perestroika. Think of stroika as structure, 
Um, so they're restructuring the economy. They're going to reduce military spending and try to increase uh, the amount of consumer goods and food and the thing, the necessities that people in um, the Soviet Union needed, but they weren't getting. Right? They were being deprived of that, and so um, their their lives were um, pretty poor uh, in the Soviet Union at this time. They also wanted to increase international trade. So he wants to bring about all of these reforms, and what it does eventually, along with other things, is it brings down communism. It's the end of the Cold War maybe. Right, so here's Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. They meet for the first time in Geneva um, at this conference in 1985 during Reagan's second term, right? So they were only supposed to meet for about 15 minutes, but they, they met for much longer than that, and they spoke without interpreters um, because Gorbachev spoke English, right? Uh, but anyway, what they agreed upon was reducing the number of weapons, nuclear weapons, between us and the Soviet Union by 50%. So that was huge. And that just that really softened the Cold War, right? Um, one thing, though, they didn't like Star Wars, which had been developed in Reagan's first term, and they were doing research on it. Um, they, they thought that that gave the United States an advantage. I don't know. Uh, so they, they opposed that. Okay, they're later going to have other summits, one at Reykjavik in Iceland in 1986, right? Um, still, they don't like SDI, and Reagan's like, oh, we're going we're gonna to get it anyway, we're going to keep it. Then they met in Washington, D.C. in 1987, right? Um, what the Soviet Union found is they no longer could compete with the United States in terms of weaponry uh, due to poor economic conditions, right? They also signed the Intermediate um, Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, so that's the IMF treaty, so that's huge. And then they meet again in Moscow. Um, Reagan's going to go to Russia, right? They call each other their friends. Um, the only problem with this is that once they loosened up in the Soviet Union, um, they were having economic hard times, and so Gorbachev lost popularity. There was even a coup where he was kidnapped, and Boris Yeltsin is going to come to power. Um, but that's not in this section. That's actually in the next section that we're not going to get to talk about. Uh, but anyway, Boris Yeltsin will come to power then. So here you see um, Mikhail Gorbachev. He's the one on the left. He has a birthmark. That makes him very distinguished. You can distinguish between him and other people quite easily um, because he has that, that birthmark on his head. Um, but here they're signing the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty. Right? So they're signing it in the White House. And they met again. Um, here's a picture of them in the White House. They became quite good friends. Here Reagan goes to the Berlin Wall, that's the Brandenburg Gate, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, right? The, and it came down two years later. Right? I never thought that I would see that in my lifetime. Uh, but the wall had become that symbol uh, for the Cold War. And if you remember, John F. Kennedy went there and he said, ich bin ein Berliner. Right? So then um, Reagan's going to go there as well. And then here the two cowboys are on the left. This is at Reagan's ranch in California. Uh, Gorbachev was going to go visit him. And like I said, they became good friends. The picture on the right is in the Capitol Rotunda. Um, this is Reagan's casket. He was uh, laid to rest, or actually he, he was laid in state there in the Rotunda for I don't know how many days. This was back about 2003, perhaps. Um, but Gorbachev came for his funeral. Okay, so this is the final slide, and as we have gone through um, throughout contemporary American history, we started looking at Truman first. And as you know, um, this what this does is it shows their popularity uh, throughout their presidency. So um, Truman's popularity went down because of the Korean War. If you look at Johnson's, his, his went down because of Vietnam. Nixon's went down because of um, Watergate. Right, George H. W. Bush's went down because of the first Gulf War, and George W. Bush's went down because of Iraq and Afghanistan. If you look at uh, Clinton's popularity, he got impeached and it went up. Uh, Reagan's, it probably remained pretty constant, around 50%. Overall, he had a pretty good approval rating, right? Okay, 
Well, anyway, thank you for listening. Hope to talk to you next year. Bye.